The president of Nigeria and chairman of ECOWAS, President Bola Tinobu, set to address COP28 with over 70,000 world leaders. Presidents, ministers, UN leadership, climate change advocates, participants, observers, and journalists in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. Thanks for joining us on the program. I am Abosedi Adeni Radiremi. You can join the conversation now on X, formerly Twitter, using the hashtag Beyond 100 Days and at TVC News NG. The President, Bola Tinobu, is joined by the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Beta Edu, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Environment, Minister of Finance, among other top Nigerian government officials at COP28. Long-time campaigner on climate issues, King Charles III, earlier today addressed world leaders calling for the restoration of nature's economy. We have details in this report. The United Nations annual climate summit is underway in Dubai, with world leaders approving a climate disaster fund that will help vulnerable nations cope with the impact of drought, floods and rising seawater. The agreement marked a positive signal of momentum at the start of the conference, known as COP28. In an opening address to the United Nations Climate Summit, King Charles told world leaders that dangers of climate change were no longer a distant risk and urged them to take more action. I have seen across the Commonwealth and beyond countless communities which are unable to withstand repeated shocks, whose lives and livelihoods are laid waste by climate change. Unless we rapidly repair and restore nature's unique economy based on harmony and balance, which is our ultimate sustainer, our own economy and survivability will be imperiled. Similarly, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said COP28 will underline the need to preserve a livable climate, while emphasizing that the production of coal, oil and gas must rapidly decline. We cannot save a burning planet via fire holes of fossil fuels. We must accelerate a just, equitable transition to renewables. The science is clear. The 1.5 degree limit is only possible if we ultimately stop burning all fossil fuels, not reduce, not abate, phase out with a clear time frame aligned with 1.5 degrees. In the meantime, the United Arab Emirates and Germany have pledged $100 million to the loss and damage fund while the UK pledged £60 million. UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayyan also announced a $30 billion green investment fund designed to bridge the climate finance gap. Esther Mokariola, TVC News. Well, joining us on the program for more on the development is climate change activist Israel Oreka. Thank you for joining us uh, this today. Uh, well, let's begin with that profound statement from King Charles III. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. What is your interpretation of that statement? Yeah, that statement is a clear interpretation that we belong to earth because we, we, we live here, we also die here at the same time. I'm not sure. We live here, and we also die here, and the need for us to protect the earth is the salient truth that we all must work together to ensure that we fight the common goal of maintaining 1.5 degrees. So that is uh, what Chris Charles was uh, relatively saying, that is a call for action for everybody, because the earth belongs to us. Uh, the earth is for us and it is our right to protect it. So that is why uh, this uh, essence of this meeting to ensure that all are sundry, together we fight the impact of climate change. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, the narrow there. And I think uh, we begin to see a little light from the long pledges uh, that have been coming in uh, for over 400 million uh, so far. But uh, still a call for concern, still a far cry to 100 billion 
the last annually that's approach that was initially I marked to actually uh, put activities together to ensure that uh, we keep one point five alive. Yes, Mr. Reka, so we'll still Mr. Reka, we'll still talk about yeah. Uh, the loss and damage fund and the pledges by the countries because, you know, there's been a lot of criticism about the fact that these pledges are usually announced, but then it does appear that people don't get to see the funds that have been pledged. So we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, talking about some more profound statements coming from that gathering, King Charles did make a call that World leaders should ensure this is actually a turning point, a move from talking to actually acting. Do you see that commitment coming from the world leaders who are gathered for this conference this time? Uh, so far, we've been talking, and there's no way you can erode talking from the whole uh, point. Uh, without talk, there's no action. But right now, I think there is slight commitment, but we still want more. Uh, because uh, we don't no longer need to play with uh, the impact of the crisis everywhere. It's obvious that climate change is here, and we must do something to ensure that we mitigate the impact. So what Chris Jackson is saying is say we should roll up our sleeves, and all of us together, let's fight this impact of climate change. And the, what we have seen so far is a far cry to what we are expecting, because we are only seeing for the funding right now we only have 400 million. It's not even up to a billion. And if you look at that funding mechanism that currently is going to be domiciled with the World Bank, the World Bank is going to also charge their administrative charges from that same fund. So maybe their administrative charges, let's spend it at 24%, and which they were contemplating on as one of the administrative charges. When you deduct that from the, the 400 uh, a million, you see Local communities still going to still sit without nothing, still hope, and still keep hoping because there's no way this kind of fund will get to them. Because when administrative technicalities and every other thing that we're taking away from the fund, we'll still remain where we are. So there is need for real commitment and more concrete pledges that will actually reach out to the local communities, which do not commit this offense, but they are bearing the brunt of it. So that is why. We are also saying to them, let them be sincere. If they love God, if they love the earth, if they love the universe, let them all commit to ensuring that we mitigate this climate change crisis that uh, is facing us. Uh, yeah. we, we know that there's been some uh, clapback on uh, the United States for its uh, pledge. Uh, you know, this time, uh, it's just like a fraction of what the United Arab Emirates, uh, as a host of COP28, actually pledged. Uh, uh, what do you think, uh, this issue of commitment, it does appear that countries have their priorities and some of them don't exactly see climate change as, uh, you know, topmost to take so much fun from the economy. Yes, they actually don't want to own up that they are the real polluters. They are the ones that are actually cause this damage. So if they are putting a lot of funds in there, it looks as if we owe them an entitlement to ensure that they commit to these funds attractively. So they're just like playing, playing ball with these same funds. And they don't want to come attractively. The global not. They are the ones that are industrialized nations. They are the ones that are emitting. They are the ones that are committing over 90% of the emission that is uh, the greenhouse gases today. So at uh, the global south, we, we barely commit need to because we, we are not industrialized nation like that. And we are polluting. We really need to own up that they, are, that they want uh, committing a major impact of this climate crisis so that uh, we can have a way through. Because if they keep playing uh, lip service to this impact, will all be eroded with this impact of climate crisis. And we are seeing the impact, devastating impact everywhere. It's no longer a news that is uh, far fresh from any one of us. So we are also uh, telling them to what, put talk to action, from talk to action to ensure that they commit, commit their various uh, institutions, industries. Yes, and Mr. Reka. Mm. They don't want to provide energy sufficiency, energy efficiency for, and that are accessible for local people to begin to transit towards 
the renewables. So this is where the actions really lies. This is where the work really uh, we really want need to put effort if we actually want to see face out completely. If not, we're still going to be playing around dirty dirty fossil fuel and call it face out, which is not really face out. Mr. Eric, I would talk some more about matters regarding COP28, but that will be after this break. So please hold on and we'll continue the conversation shortly. Thanks for staying with us on the program. We are talking COP28 and uh, developments arising therefrom. And uh, joining us on the program is climate change activist Israel Oreka. Mr. Oreka, we were talking about uh, fossil fuels and, of course, the commitment by countries to this cause. What do you make of a petrol state hosting a COP summit? Can you repeat yourself again? I'm not getting... Yes, I am asking what you think about a, an oil-producing state, an oil-producing country actually being... ...in the business. So it's a whole lot of value chain. So uh, they are not seeing it as... Uh, Oil country, they are seeing it as business. Dubai, they are good at business. So they take up the tax to see how they could use it to drive their economy. They were really smart at it. That is why, no matter the criticism that comes, they were seeing the business part of it. So they are oil producing country, fine. And they also want to boost their economy. They want to open up uh, more opportunity for tourist attraction more opportunities for people to take care of and uh, to know what they are having. There are various expo, there are more, all these opportunities to showcase Dubai to the world. So that is why they actually see it as one of their key priorities to invest in it because they are going to get a huge lot of return. I think they are really business uh, experts and they, they seem the business part of the COP activity. That is why they took up uh, this uh, task. Because for, for us, coming around for this year call. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of economic boost is going to give to the economy. So it's, it's a win-win for them. And that is right. why I think uh, they pushed for it and they got it. All right. Let's talk about Nigeria in all of this. Of course, Nigeria is represented. President Bola Tinobo is there, along with uh, senior government officials who are actually participating in this conference. The president has met with King Charles, and you know, it is believed that that is a pointer that this would bring up positive news, positive results for Nigeria as a country. How would you say we are faring in achieving climate resilience in our societies? Uh, I, I think I will first of all commend the president at least for taking that bold step to leave the shore of Nigeria to be at this event and to make its uh, impact towards uh, what climate change is and how Nigeria can take advantage of uh, the current uh, event here. But my take is uh, uh, the president needs to ensure that he gathers a lot of evidence of the impact of climate change as it affects us. Uh, we have serious part of our uh, climate change impact, the flooding, the, the, the pollution, and the drought. This cut across the various... Uh, uh, geopolitical zones in Nigeria. I think uh, these are some of the issues that he should put forward to ensure that he raise a lot of money to start mitigating action for local communities in Nigeria. We are suffering from the impact of climate change, there is no doubt. So I think there is, is, this is the time for him to gather the data, gather uh, the various stories, and come share here why our, our funding, loss and damage fund Nigeria should benefit from it. Uh, I know Nigeria is pushing for energy transition. Energy transition have like 62% of our indices, which, uh, which is quite huge. But there are other uh, areas which is land use, I follow land use. Uh, that also, we also need to encourage the president to also look into as the areas to benefit local community. Remember in his statement, he said, let the poor breathe. I think uh, President Bola met Tumudu and also use this event as one of the uh, key connections to let the poor breathe so that we can be breathing well from pollution, so that we can be breathing well from drought, so that we can be breathing well for poor yield of our agricultural products, so that we can be breathing well from those fishes that are no longer, uh, that we can no longer see due to pollution. 
construction of our waterways, of our waters. So these are some of the documentaries and the impact I want you to also look into. Energy is good, but a poor man who have not eaten will not think of going into energy business or even acquiring this uh, equipment because it's quite capital intensive. So those farming, agricultural support, those uh, livelihood support, these are areas I also want the president to also see as a key agenda to letting the poor breed as an alternative towards the poor sources removal that he just uh, put in from where he entered into office. Because this will also make uh, the local community see that he actually care for them. He feel their pain, not just on, on television, but he actually bring their issues forward. So we are expecting Bola, Baba Bala met you know, uh, the Jagaba himself to ensure that he carries the local community sufferings and pain All right. uh, to cop decision-making table, yes. All right, and nice. before embarking on that trip, you know, uh, uh, there, there is actually, you know, there was uh, some talk about the fact that the president's message would focus greatly on holding businesses and institutions accountable. So it's like, it would be business as usual. Businesses would have to be responsible for whatever levels of degradation they cause to the environment. Do you see the political will to actually make all of these happen? It, we have the climate to make it happen. It now depends on the Mr. President himself to actually see it as his own priority need for the people. If he actually cares for the people, as he says, I think this is the time he should show it. And let him put actions to those words. Let us see most of those conversation is going to be having. I think it should be having some with the UAE government today. Let it be on how we will strengthen local community participation in climate change and mitigation and adaptation. Let us see how funds will be driven towards empowering local communities, which are its own key priority area, which I know that it wants to also focus on. So uh, improving business, also small, small scale and medium enterprises can also be benefited from this if uh, we have uh, this opportunity uh, drive towards it. So the political will still rest on his or us to actually see that if you keep that promise that the local communities are bestowing on him to see that the people will truly will breach from his conversation and engagement here in Dubai. But talk to us about what is expected of us as citizens, as individuals, the kinds of activities we should actually be carrying out. Because as it is, you know, a number of us still go ahead dropping sachets and waste in uh, drainages in, you know, on the highway, just through a car window or a bus window. All of those things still happen. I would like you to speak to the conscience of Nigerian people as to what is expected of them in achieving a climate resilient <coughs> country. Yes, uh, I think there is need for us to improve what we call more... Uh, capacity building, awareness creation. Like for us in our organization, Connected Advocacy, we have what we call the POS, Protect, Unite for a Safer Environment. If we understand that it is the activities of human beings that impacts on our climate, we also begin to see how we reduce uh, the way we commit these offenses, because it's offense to nature. And also uh, the policies also should be, uh, there are policies that restrict train of refuge on uh, through the car or this, uh, just indiscriminate dumping of uh, refuse. There are policies to that. There is need for government to ensure implementation. Our problem with poli we, in that country is not, uh, we don't have policies. We have policies both from state, local, and federal that also speaks to this. I think government should also begin to clean up those policies from the shelf and make them work. And also, we are citizens. The climate impact rests on us because we feel the brunt directly. There's need for us to have what we call attitudinal change. We, we need to have a mindset shift. And also, we need to also understand that it is the activity that we are doing, the bush burning, the train of refuge, the indiscriminate dumping of this refuge that blocks our waterways and also goes straight to, what, to our aquatic life to destroy them as well. Because most of those things are biodegradable. Uh, so non biodegradable. So the truth right. of the matter is, I just want to appeal to our people to improve on their work awareness, awareness, more awareness at the grassroots. Let people know that these are the things that they are doing that is actually uh, causing the impact of climate change. So if they know, 
need to improve on it. Yes. Yes. Israel Loreka is a climate change activist. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me.